you're not talking about, pardon me for saying this, but you're not talking about people who are fully human. They can't be. To do such things, you cannot be. This is a very biblical, possibly apocalyptic, certainly confusing and complicated time. Remember, this is a church who is in an alliance with the Communist Party of China. They are allowing the bishops of China to be chosen by the Communist Party. Hello, my friends, from war in the Middle East to war at the Vatican with the Synod on Synodality. We are going to be talking this week on Faith and Reasoning about all what's going on in the world in the most strange time. And what was that weird kind of Pachamama doll that McCain handed to the Pope? All that and much more on this episode of Faith and Reason. Stay tuned. The Church is in the greatest crisis of its 2,000-year history. The Church, our mother, needs your help like never before. Bishop Fulton J. Sheen said, Who's going to save our Church? It's not the bishops. It's not our priests. It's not the religious. It's up to you, the people. You have the minds, the eyes, and the ears to save our Church. Your mission is to see that priests act like priests, your bishops act like bishops, and the religious act like religious. Those are the words of Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. And yes, we are called to pray and fast. We're all called to pray and fast about this. But some of you are called to lead this fight. Some of you are called to fund the effort. Where are you called? Pray about that. And heed the Holy Spirit. As you know, the Synod on Synodality is about to launch. LifeSite will be there reporting every day on what's taking place. And we already know that it will be a scandal. But we are also called to act. And some, especially those called by the Holy Spirit, are asked to speak boldly, to reject the falsehood, and stand for the unchanged and unchangeable truth of Christ and His one holy Catholic and apostolic Church. If you feel that you are called to be one of those leaders, consider joining us in Rome at the end of the Synod to be there as a sign of resistance to the setting up of a false new church and as a sign of adherence to the only church founded by Christ himself. Rome Life Forum is a two-day strategy conference for Catholic leaders defending the truths which are most under threat on sexuality, family, and liturgy. Are you called to leadership in this fight? Are you called to join us at Rome Life Forum? If so, go to RomeLifeForum.com and I'll see you in the Eternal City with Cardinal Muller, with Bishop Joseph Strickland, and an army of faithful Catholics such as Michael Matt, Alexander Chugowell, Reggie Littlejohn, Liz Yor, Christopher Ferrara, Terry Barber, Hugh Owens, and many more willing to die for the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of our fathers. This is John Henry Weston for LifeSite News. May God bless you. And now, back to the program. Hey, my friends, so good to be with you again. Hi, John Henry. Jack, Father Murr, and Liz Yor, all of you here. Father, if you wouldn't mind... Start us off with a prayer, please, if you could. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of our death, amen. Seed of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Amen. So I think um, we're right to start with the war in Israel right now. we saw a on October the 7th, the day, if you will, of Our Lady of the Rosary, the, the historic uh, victory uh, at Lepanto, um, an attack by Hamas on Israel, uh, which was quite devastating. I believe the numbers now are over 1,200 Israelis killed, almost 3,000 injured. Um, and there's been all sorts of now 
of course, a, a volley of return uh, bombing in the Gaza Strip and all of this going on. Um, Liz, would you like to give us more details? This horrific attack was on the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. Um, and um, Hamas terrorists staged a shock military attack on Israel by air, water, and sea. It apparently has really um, surprised, certainly surprised Israel. They were not prepared for it. Um, and um, the attacks have left a number of hostages, somewhere in the range of 20, maybe 40 hostages. Um, Americans have been killed. I mean, some of the Americans are part of the hostages as well. Um, and um, it was just announced that the prime minister, Bibi Netanyahu, has formed a unity government. Um, so they are moving forward with a ground game um, in Gaza. You know, for those of us that have been following you know, revelations, following apparitions, prophecies. This is um, a very biblical, possibly apocalyptic, certainly confusing and complicated time, horrifying bloodshed. But I think it's important to, um, for all of us, you know, it wasn't just a year ago, was it? We were in the fog of war of Ukraine um, and the shifting alliances, the hidden agendas, um, the difficulty in really trying to assert what's truth from fiction. It's uh, a very scary time. And I think it's as well as a wake up call for Israel, certainly a wake up call for the world um, and for those of us in the United States. Um, you know, the questions, of course, are coming already. I think it'll be months before they're actually answered was this a failure of intelligence was this incompetency was this complacency um certainly there were a lot of intelligence agencies the united states egypt a number of the countries in the middle east who share intelligence with the israelis this was a massive attack that many military leaders are now saying probably was in the works for over a year uh, but uh israel seemed to totally missed the signs. And we're seeing every day bloodshed on both sides. It is horrific. And of course, the greatest fear is that this will be um, extended to other countries and the war will um, seep into past the Middle East, throughout the Middle East and into Europe. So we have Ukraine um, on one hand, and now a terrifying war now going on is in the Middle East, in Israel. Um, these are scary times, and I think it's important for all of us to double down on our prayers, um, on our fasting, and to really take a hard look at um, what's happening and to really pay attention, not only what's going on in other parts of the world, but especially in our own homeland. Liz, the patriarchs of Jerusalem have just called on a day for prayer, fasting, and abstinence on October the 17th. They've begged for prayers from the whole world for peace. Um, Jack, I'm really itching to ask you a question with regard to this notion of the Israeli intelligence getting caught off guard. I listened to Erfat Fenningzon. She's a journalist in Israel. She is a former member of the IDF uh, intelligence community. She said there's no way, there's no way that the Mossad could have missed this. It's absolutely impossible. Uh, Roy Schumann, uh, a very famous convert from um, from Judaism to Catholicism, has also said there's not a single Jew in Israel who believes that the this was possibly missed uh, in in terms of their intelligence community. What's going on? I would disagree with her assessment. I, I think one of the dangers of this uh, technological world that we live in is that for the last 20 years, certainly in the United States and longer, really, and the Israelis are experts at electronic surveillance. This is the way that their intelligence services have been able to target everything from nuclear scientists in Iran on a highway to all the chatter. Every single conversation in Gaza Strip is being monitored for keywords, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the problem. It's not the only way to communicate. You go back to pen and pencil. You go back to uh, you know isolated cells where no one really knows the whole game. Everybody's just preparing for a big day and be ready. 
and uh, you gather together 1,500 to 2,000 guys and you cross the border in coordination, they were caught underfoot. I think to say that they knew it was going to happen implies that they had an interest in it happening, and I, I can't imagine that. If they knew it was going to happen, then it would have been in their interest to thwart it just as it occurred with maximum damage to their enemies. This is the same sort of canard, I think, that came out after the 9-11, where all of a sudden this was going to be blamed on, you know, a U.S. intelligence who had an interest in seeing you know, a tragedy occur so that they could get into a war. I, I don't think that's true. I, and I don't think that's true in this case. The suffering is immense. I think one of the tragic things, uh, and it shows you the impact of the war in Ukraine, is that apparently the Israelis have for decades and decades been one of the largest stockpiles, strategic stockpiles of things like 155 millimeter artillery shells, 500 pound bombs, things like this, uh, laws rockets for anti-tank, anti-material. And apparently we've never drawn it down. It's always been there as a kind of mutual insurance policy. If we needed it in a regional conflict, then Israel always had a backup supply. Well, apparently the greater proportion of the artillery shells, particularly, were sent to dear Ukraine. The poor Israelis are a little bit under, under uh, gun right now. And not, not that they can't take care of business, but they may have to change a little bit of strategy. For example, in the uh, 2014 conflict with Gaza, you know, they, put over, I think, 25, 30,000 artillery shells. And this looks like a potentially larger conflict, and I'm just not certain of how great their supply is. Particularly, people should pay attention, I think, also to what is happening with uh, Hezbollah coming across the border with Syria and the edge of Lebanon. Uh, this creates the potential for a, a second kind of front on the Israelis, they are, uh, I think, fully capable. I'm certainly praying for them every day. It's been uh, traumatic to watch and see it unfold, but it's going to be, I think, inspiring to see how this small group of people fights back. And I think they have to fight back, and I think it should be a wake-up call to the whole world that uh, none of us are safe from a coordinated uh, operation just like this. And it highlights the danger of this open border uh, concept that we seem to suffer in the West that allows in tens of thousands of military aged men. I mean, you don't see any women and kids on these boats crossing the channel, just like you don't see any women and kids for the most part crossing across the US border. Certainly not when we're talking about countries from, uh, shall we say, our friends in the Middle East. So uh, this should be a wake up call for the whole world concerning the security aspects. And uh, I, I really pray that the Palestinians do the smart thing and hand over those hostages very soon, like today, uh, because uh, otherwise, I think there's no choice for Israel but to make sure that this threat does not exist for the future. Which Palestinians you, you were referring to, you mean Hamas to hand over the Israeli hostages, is that what you mean? Yes, that's exactly what I mean. Oh, okay. And let's not forget, these people were celebrating uh, in Sydney, Australia, uh, in front of the Opera House, screaming gas the Jews. You had people celebrating in the streets of London, there's multiple videos of this, waving flags, all excited about what has happened. Uh, do not think that, you know, the rest of Western culture is not on their hit list, too. And it's very disturbing to see this outpouring uh, of joy amongst uh, peoples spread all across the planet Earth, and a great proportion of them, I might have add, came post 9-11 uh, after George Bush promised us that we're going over there so that we don't have to fight these battles in our own streets. 
uh, one of the greatest lies ever told in history. I mean, this is something that we all have to be aware of. This is a cultural reality. And um, I, I think it's uh, such a shame that this many people have to die and suffer to prove these simple concepts to the rest of us. One of the analyses that um, I just heard from Xavier Aral from this is from uh, I think French military analysis of what's going on, but one of the things is suggested that you know this is a ploy. It's a ploy to um, especially the use of the horrific use of hostages, which um, is just unspeakable. But the game, if you will, uh, there was no plan for Hamas to <laughs> to actually take over Israel. That, that was never uh, their objective. They glory in their so-called martyrdom, um, and but the objective uh, was it was suggested is to uh, encourage Israel to do something that is, um, you know, they might feel justified for some kind of attack that's so severe, counterattack that's so severe, that even hits Iran. And should they do something like that, that would spark unity among all the uh, different uh, Islamic countries, uh, and then basically be the, the fuel for a third world war. I sort of beg to differ on that, John, because uh, even just today, I saw that a spokesman for Hezbollah, right, you know, no real friend of Israel, and actually was dumping a few of their own rockets across the border in the midst of all of this, came out and said, we don't support kidnapping women and children. So there's, I, I think, you know, gone are the days where these kind of crimes could be committed in a kind of uh, print fashion where we hear about atrocities like things that happened in the Pol Pot's regime and Cambodia, but we didn't really see the photographs. It wasn't live action. And we're seeing that right here. And we're seeing the responses of various groups around the world, including uh, our own lovely Ilana Omar in the United States Congress. Uh, well done, Minnesota. Even Erdogan doesn't hide it, right? What did he say? You know, our wombs are our minarets, you know, stand by, right? I mean, Let's let's something I think has to be acknowledged here about the dangerous aspect of some people with who claim to be the followers of the Islamic faith wanting to kill people. It's a pattern, if nothing else. And I think that this should be a grand wake up call for the whole world about uh, some of the immigration issues that we're watching occur across particular. It's definitely a program uh, that they're on, and uh, it's interesting that they choose these various dates, 9-11, uh, the date of the Battle of Vienna, and uh, October 7th, the date of Lepanto, um, to, to make their assaults. Father, your take on any of this? Obviously, I'm no expert on uh, surveillance or on intelligence reports, but I will remind us that the United States government learned of the fall of communist Russia on CNN. Our own intelligence, which is supposed to be the most magnificent in the world, had no idea that the fall of communist Russia was happening. They learned on it. They learned about it on, on watching the news. There are a couple components too that I wanted to, to mention. First of all, I was in New York during 9-11. I was a pastor of Our Lady Guadalupe on 14th Street. Which, uh, which was uh, a block and a half from St. Vincent's Hospital. I remember the shock of the whole thing. I remember it because we lived it. I didn't see it on the news. We lived it. Uh, it was horrific. Uh, but I also remembered, and, and our churches were packed. The churches were packed. Believe me, uh, on 14th Street, you, uh, this, I left the church open uh, 24 hours a day so that people could come in and make visits. And there was always there were always people coming in. Uh, it was amazing how uh, the, a sense of, of, of God and religion uh, uh, <laughs> awoke in people, and uh, they felt that need. But I also remember a, a famous line of Fulton J. Sheen, who said, go to the moon, and three days later, they won't remember your name. 
how quickly we got over that was surprising to me. How quickly we got over that. How quickly we get over these things. And we don't seem really to learn in the long run. It's it's a, a shock for the moment. And then it passes. Uh, another thing. I think this was the first time, maybe wrong, but for me it was the first time that I saw uh, footage of the carnage of this of this sort. I mean, it, it, mind-boggling isn't the term. And I was surprised by, I, I listened to a, a podcast at night to help me sleep. I fall asleep to, to podcasts. And they're, they're kind of good ones, a lot of, a lot of them informative. People were absolutely stunned. They said, they cut off the heads, they decapitated babies. You know that you're getting older, uh, advanced in age when you start answering the telephone, or not the telephone, the television back and, and your, your computer back. Well, I, I answered back and I said, well, excuse me, this has been going on for years. It's called abortion. Then it occurred to me, well, oh, maybe what people need to do is see what they've done. As horrific as that sounds, don't, don't I mean, it's horrible. But maybe the impact isn't there because it's take, it, this is a, it's, a, it's a mess cleaned up and we don't have to deal with it. This the the uh, the footage of this attack was horrific, just horrific. I don't remember seeing anything that hit me harder. And I was involved in 9 11. I, I was at the hospitals. I was at the armory with people who had lost people looking for 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 people. This was incredible. There was one last one last comment that I have to make that I I just shook my head. When I read it, Israel's ambassador to the Vatican. I wrote, I, I sent this to you, Liz, I think. <laughs> Israel's ambassador to the Vatican, before anything was said, the Vatican hadn't made a remark, asked the Vatican, please do not speak to us in ambiguous language. <laughs> I said, well, you're, you're talking to the wrong people. <laughs> they have a, they have the, they have it. They have a, a monopoly on, uh, on, on ambiguous uh, terms and languages. There's something wrong also with people saying right from the beginning, and I understand their motivation for it, but saying right from the beginning, well, now let's sit down and let's reason and let's not lose our cool. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Did you see what what happened? No, let's sit down and reason together. And let's not lose our patience. I don't know how Israel could could stand it. The United States couldn't stand it. When when that when that when 9-11 happened, pardon me for saying this. I mean, I know it's going to sound incorrect politically, but we had to do something. Bush felt he had to do something. I think he did something horrendous. Uh, but uh, by starting a, a attacks on just the way he did, but we had to do something. We had to react. You just can't tell people, well, now let's sit down and, and be calm about this. Uh, boy, uh, taking women out and raping them as they're pulling them a half dead naked through the streets, cutting heads off of this, shooting old ladies at the bus. It, it's insane. You're not talking about, pardon me for saying this, but you're not talking about people who are fully human. They can't be. To do such things, you cannot be. There's something wrong. There's something very wrong. There's something wrong in, in, in religious formation. And, and this is happening all over the world. These are things that the West should be addressing. I also was very upset that there was no outrage from Muslim nations. They all remained quiet. If Ireland, which is a Catholic, well, used to be, used to be a Catholic country. If Ireland would do something horrific, the United States, Canada, uh, France, all of Christian nations should should uh, denounce it. It's, it's horrific. They all remain quiet. And in that quiet is a complicitness. There, 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 there's a participation in it. It's a quiet participation, it's silent, but it's there. I think we have a lot to be looking out for, a lot to be looking out for. I, I think it's uh, I think it's quite scary. Lepanto and the gates of Vienna, if they're not, if they're, they weren't uh, uh, great lessons to humanity, they should, they should be. G.K. Chesterton said, and in, in his time, he said, there isn't a schoolboy in England 
who doesn't know the date of of September 11th or the or the date of uh, or the date of of uh, of, of Lepanto uh, uh, on, on October 7th we knew nobody knows that any longer you brought it up John Henry thank goodness I was going to bring it up but the, besides this group, I don't know that there are many people in the world who remember those things, and they really should be remembered. If we we want to get our curriculum back into schools and, and, and wake people up and make mature human beings, they should know their history, and they're not being taught any of this. That's scary. The whole thing is scary. Scary. You know, I guess the question is, is this the beginning of World War III? And as Father, you pointed out, um, there are no atheists in foxholes, right? Um, when we look face war, uh, that's when we uh, find religion. Uh, we have no one to turn to but God. Um, my concern at this point, um, as a learning lesson, what's happening in, in Israel is the 8 to 10 million people who have crossed into our country illegally. We don't know who they are. Um, there's signs that up to 100,000 Chinese, military age Chinese um, are in the country, um, very much our mortal enemy. And while the Muslim world was talking about Israel, their focus also was the great Satan, which is the United States and the destruction of the great Satan in the United States. And frankly, right now, reports from the border are that Syrian military age men, Syrian military age men are pouring across the border. You know, we used to think, remember, America was an island. We had an ocean on one side, an ocean on the other. We were safe. We forgot about the northern border and the southern border. Um, so uh, I think, you know, the lesson is, as Father points out, is that we need to turn to God. We need to double down on our prayer life, pray that peace um, somehow is resumed in uh, the Middle East, it always seems to be a powder keg. Um, but the great, my great fear is that this will expand to World War III. We've got Ukraine um, simmering over there, and now um, Israel uh, with Hamas. So um, it's terrifying. And I think we, um, we need to uh, really turn to our later Lepanto, our Lady of Victory. That's that. I think that's the message of this terrible attack for we Catholics. I think a spiritual message would be um, to turn to the rosary um, as the only way we're going to stop this man's inhumanity against man. It's it's that's war. It's sad that that's what, what prompts people to turn to the rosary. I, I find that I turn to it a couple times an hour all day long. So, Father, you brought up two very interesting points where you said you saw these images and it was seeing these images that really brought home to you the terrifying aspects of this and you uh made the metaphor to the murder of the unborn and on a purely secular basis i think one of the greatest things that changed people's minds because let's face it it wasn't just catholics who were pro-life you know this was a movement that covered all bases was the technology that allowed the mothers to see the little growing fetus in real time with sonograms and later even better technology and there were doctor's offices that where you could get a printout of your fetus week by week if you wanted to and this human nature and this uh innate desire to protect children is hardwired even into the atheist, I think, if properly trained. So I think you're right. I do think that the, on both counts, I think that the images are very important. I don't think that we should hide this stuff. I think that the world needs to know what is potentially out there. And I'm very worried because Hamas apparently yesterday put out a global uh, plea to the followers to be prepared, to be prepared. You know, we're taking this to the West. So uh, I think everybody should be in a state in the faith community of Islam in this country coming out and condemning the behavior of uh, some of their own. 
shall we say, or some who claim to be part of their group, right? Uh, just like, Father, you brought up Ireland. Good Irish people did not support the IRA, right? They did not support the terrorism that was associated with it, even though they might have supported a unified Ireland. But to see the silence across the global community, in fact, the only people who seem to be coming forward and in very tepid fashion are some trying to repair their reputations from for, former comments. But I, I'm gratified to see that Wall Street is punching back. Today, uh, you have Wall Street banks requesting the names of all the Harvard students at those pro-Palestinian or organizations because they want to make sure that they do not get hired. I think that uh, rational people are beginning to understand some of the poisonous nature of the things that we've been forced fed for the last 60 years with all this moral relativism and you know everybody is alike and and all cultures are the same this is just not true you have to navigate with respect but also uh, at least a competent understanding of the differences between these cultures and uh, I think this is a big wake-up call. I, I'm, uh, I hope that the world takes it as such. And I think that we have to remember that Israel is the guardian of our holy places, too. I don't think they wouldn't be ransacked. They would. I stand with them 100%. I, I, uh, I, I feel for them. They're in a bit of a pickle. Because uh, how do you go and have uh, urban combat it's a very dangerous business it's why so many people were killed when we went into Fallujah. this is a much denser kind of construction almost like out of control filled with tunnels it, it's it, it's a high mortality uh battle space the reason for which they're doing it right they want to probably draw the israelis in i know that they've called up 400,000 reservists, but, you know, let's face it, you know, the average reservist is not necessarily prepared for urban combat. We spent lots of money and spent lots of training time preparing guys for urban combat in Iraq. Uh, it was a catch-up game to a certain extent, but it's, it's a skill set. And even with the skill set, it's a tough game to play. And it, I don't know if they're going to go in there on the ground. I don't know how you do it without just making sure there's no one in front of you effectively with the resources that they have. Again, you know, with the resources that they have. Uh, I think it's interesting that Ham not Hamas, but the Palestinian Authority today said they please will you open up corridors for people to leave and for needed supplies to get in and give us a heads up for when you're going to bomb and where, right? Okay, this this means that, you know, that there's not a 100% unity on the other side of the wall in Gaza, right? There are people who have something to lose here. Interestingly, I have not seen the Egyptians say, oh, everybody come over here. You know, <laughs> I would see the Syrians be like, why don't you guys just move here? You know, get out of there and come on over here and you can you can farm our desert. You know, nobody's doing that for them. It's uh there much as the West and the college student loves to talk about, oh, the dear Palestinians, they're not even exactly loved by their peers. They're they're seen as a kind of an annoyance, a a difficult situation, but nobody wants them. Nobody wants to import this kind of uh, focused hatred because they cause problems in the other Arab countries, right? Because they they bring wrath down on them because they're using them for for training, funding, etc.
Hey friends, so to celebrate the momentous overturning of Roe v. Wade, we at LifeSite have minted just under 10,000 of these brand new limited edition pro-life silver rounds. Each round is stamped on the back with an image of the Supreme Court of the United States featuring the date that the High Court delivered this historic victory. And on the front of our pure silver rounds, there's the LifeSite logo surrounded by a brilliant sunburst and draped with olive branches to commemorate LifeSite's 25 years anniversary of serving the pro-life and pro-family community. I want you to know too that if you go to St. Joseph's Partners through the LifeSite link, you will be able to fulfill there all of your silver and gold needs in this perilous time. May God bless you. Well, we have to remember there, there's Palestinian Christians too. It's not like we have a, a unified block of Hamas supporters. Uh, so there's some 600,000 people in the Gaza Strip. Uh, you have uh, a lot of Christians there as well. Um, and so, you know, when Israel just turned off the water, electricity, and gas uh, to the Gaza. And, and so that's going to hurt a lot of very innocent people. So, yeah, m war is a very messy business. Uh, I would say Hamas turned off the oil and gas and the water in the Gaza Strip, right? I mean, come on. You know, it's uh, payback's tough, but they have to isolate the bad actors and kill as many of them as they can. This is a blunt reality. You know, wars are, are you know, not won by threats. It's an emerging security threat that I think everybody needs to take seriously. It's, you know how many weapons are in France right now? Yeah, all of Western Europe has weapons all over it. Don't pretend that, that the US is the only place with guns. And, you know, most of them are illegal. I mean, if I can ship heroin, I can ship AK-47s too. It's something that I think is an emerging reality that the world is going to have to deal with. And the tactics were brilliant. They were like out of a Hollywood movie. I mean, where was U.S. intelligence when, uh, you know, 100 paragliders were ordered by some guys in the Gaza Strip with, you know, two horsepower engines on the back of them that could see two and sometimes three people. I mean, really? You know, there was a failure entirely across the board for intelligence. And uh, I, I think that they are changing their tactics. I think they're avoiding electronic communications. And I think our over-reliance on that form of communication uh, intelligence gathering is the, the weak flaw. And I think because we thought that was such a powerful tool, human intelligence has been lacking probably also in Israel, definitely is in the United States. It is interesting to me that we had this all blow up right as the church goes totally off kilter. Um, you had at the start of the synod, uh, which started off our month of October, um, insanity coming from the Pope himself, basically the denial of true marriage. And again, though not in those terms, he's, he's very much like the governments did as they introduced same-sex marriage. It came by way of talking about unions, blessing unions, civil unions. No, no, let's, let's maintain marriage. But Pope Francis already in a movie talked about supporting civil unions. Um, and yet here in the answer to the dubia comes the same kind of bifurcation. Oh, we want to not give a wrong message of marriage. But on the question on unions, then he said, well, pastors can decide prudentially if one or more persons want to come for blessings, what we can do as long as it doesn't distort the meaning of marriage. But not these unions very disconcerting starting point, new starting point, if you will, to the Synod on Citadelity, which everybody thought, oh, you know, it'll come out with some ambiguous nonsense so that, you know, people who want to go toward that can do it just like the German bishops have done unpunished and the Belgian bishops have done. Um, in fact, this gives all sorts of credence to when the French bishop said a couple of years ago now that Pope Francis said he could go ahead and bless same-sex unions. Very interesting things, indeed. Anyone with a, a thought on how this new world calamity comes 
almost immediately on the heels of this infidelity by the Pope. When the world has turned away from God, um, from Jesus Christ, um, as the church, who's always been the bulwark um, of, you know, pointing pointing the world to Jesus Christ, to the um, Ten Commandments, the moral code. Um, and um, we have seen time and time again, ambiguity by uh, Francis has caused not only chaos in the church, and of course, that's what in, very early in his papacy said he wanted to create Hagen and Leah, make a, make a mess. Um, ambiguity um, is very problematic, especially with moral truths, with right and wrong. We're seeing certainly chaos in the church. I think that's that's very clear. Um, and um, we're you know losing our anchor. And frankly, the world world is losing the anchor of the Catholic Church, Guide, guiding it through world wars as it has. Everywhere we turn, things are upside down. Um, when we, you know, relied on the, you know, <laughs> the FBI intelligence, the greatest intelligence agency in the world now goes after traditional Catholics um, as terrorists. So I think we're all kind of girding ourselves for um, the results of the Synod. You know, frankly, as I said last week, I think it's all already preordained. I think he, you know, Francis has has just really telegraphed in a number of different ways. Look, I'm going to approve same sex blessings. Um, oh, but it, it doesn't mean their marriages and oh, it doesn't change the teaching of the church, which is, as my father would say, bonk. Um, and um, so you will see the slippery slope um, that he's in, engaged in. The synod is stacked like the College of Cardinals is stacked. And when there isn't um, uh, a wide range of Decision making, people with various views, being able to express their views, um, those things are going to happen. So it's preordained. I believe it's going to happen. It will cause more and more confusion in the church. Um, and that's what Francis likes, you know. And um, so uh, that to me is what we have to gird ourselves for at the end of October. God knows what's going to be happening in the Middle East at the end of October. Um, things happening are seem to be happening at a rapid pace. So that's kind of my two cents of the, you know, the integration of the Synod. Um, he is viewed by many of us, myself, I will include, as, as the moral leader, leader of the New World Order. And the New World Order is being shifted as we speak, isn't it? Um, going from the populist, nationalist Christians to the um, tyrannical globalists who tell us how to le lead our lives. So, Father, if you can give us a take on how this affects people in the pews, um, we had an unbelievable account by a priest in San Francisco, a um, Father Joseph Elo. Yeah, he writes basically saying that, you know, my job as a parish priest has become much more difficult. He's in San Francisco of all places. He tells the Pope, you're hurting my parish. Please receive the following words freely, not from Rome, but from the peripheries, he says. Um, and he says, in my city, the faith is openly mocked and attacked. And my parishioners are struggling to believe in Jesus. Most of their family members, friends, and co-workers have abandoned the Christian faith. My parishioners are clinging to simple truths of our faith, especially the church's teaching about the human person. And then uh, he said that, you know, the Pope's promotion of homosexuality has harmed his flock and made his work as a pastor more difficult. Father, tell us what this does to priests to have this go on um, from the Pope himself and, and from very many, even of the U.S. bishops, uh, now cardinals. Um, how does that affect the faith at the parish level? From the beginning of this pontificate, I saw a man who was uh, trying his best to dismantle the papacy. Now I see a man, I think, I may be wrong, I hope I am, who seems to be trying his best to dismantle the Catholic Church and its teaching. How does this affect people in the pews? It has to affect them horribly. Uh, to begin with, let's be clear, we have lost the majority of Catholics. They're lost. They're gone. And I don't know what it's going to take to get them back, but I'll tell you one thing that's not going to bring them back talking about climate change and about recycling plastic bottles 
Uh, th this is not going to do it. People are looking for God. And the church is no longer in the business of, 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 of showing them where God is. The clergy is demoralized. You can believe that, believe me, they're demoralized. I hear from many priests all over the world. Morale is, is uh, low, low to put it, low to put it uh, mildly. Uh, the people in the pews are always less and less and less and less because we don't seem to have any answers. You know, excuse me, but I don't think I would be going to a mass to listen to a priest talk about the sky is blue and the grass is green. Now, I've known priests who were absolutely horrific preachers. Couldn't preach to save their souls. But you know what they were? They were saints. And the people in their parishes knew they had a saint for a pastor. They didn't care that he had a mouthful of clover that he couldn't preach, right? That, that, that didn't matter. He was there for their sick and their dying. He brought communion to people who were, who were ailing. He stopped in, visited. He knew all of the children's name and, and their parents' name and the grandparents. This is what we need. We don't have it. We don't have it. But also, we're out of answers. Of course, we're not out of answers, okay? We have answers. We have some fantastic answers. Philosophically, Theologically, psychologically, we have answers to just about any question you can imagine. Uh, the problem is nobody's giving them. And this is being done, I fear, purposely. Purposely. That's what I'm that's what I'm afraid of. This is not hap this isn't happenstance. This is the way things are being programmed. Our Holy Father claimed he wanted transparency, he wants honesty, he wants openness. He wants dialogue. Jeez, I haven't heard the word dialogue used so much since the 1960s. They resurrected that one. Dialogue. Let's have dialogue homilies. Dialogue this, dialogue. Good. Wonderful. Where is the openness? Where is the transparency? People are sworn to secrecy. You can't know what's going on in, 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 in these meetings. This is incredible. This is incredible. I know regimes, without using the word communist before that, regime too. I know regimes in the world that, that are more open than this. This is incredible. This is incredible. And I'm telling you, the, the only thing, the thing that's good that's going to come out of all of this is that it's going to be so apparent what, rent, what went wrong and who was, who was responsible for it, that those people who are responsible are going to have to take responsibility. And if they do take responsibility for what they have done, they themselves will find themselves on the outs. I really am hopeful. I'm not, I'm not pessimistic on the whole thing. I'm hopeful because God's with his church. God knows what he's done and, and what he does. And he can use any sort of situation to make good come from it. And he will. It's just, I'd like to see it in my lifetime. I'd like to see it before I die, that, that kind of thing. I'm a little bit, I'm a spoiled brat, I guess, that way. But that's that's what I'm anxious for uh, about this idea. This is this is so Marxist. This is so Marxist. This this this, this way of doing things. We're not going. No 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 no. Nobody's blessing. No nobody's talking about a sacramental marriage between two two men or two women. No 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 no. no we're not talking about that at all. I remember Obama talking that way. He wasn't talking about a sacramental marriage. He was talking about marriage. Oh, I'm opposed to it. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah right. That's this. It's it's the foot in the door. It's the the negotiating, the back and forth, the dialectic. The let's go here, let's go back, two steps forward, one back. All of this constantly, and you get this. You get this going. Here's here's what it's going to end up, and you you know this. I'm telling you, play this show this show back in 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 two years. Play me talking in two years and see if I'm wrong. Uh, we're going to leave it up to the individual priests in the parish to bless same-sex unions. Not a sacrament. We're not talking about marriage here. No, 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 no. The only thing we're talking about is uh, Bill and Joe are going to come to church for a blessing. Their families, one family is going to be on one side of the church. The other family is going to be on the other side of the church. The church is going to be full of flowers. Of course, we need music. we got to have music for a blessing. 
a bit, bup, bup, bup. there'll be a gospel proclamation. The priest will come out investments to do this special, but it's not a marriage. Don't you don't be confused. Don't be confused. Right. And here's here's the real kick to this one. Here's the real, the real Marxist ultimate kick. We'll leave it up to each individual priest. All right. Well, Father Murr, what, what, you're not going to do same-sex blessings? You're not, huh? Oh, my goodness. Well, do, Father, are you aware that it, this has become a hate crime? Not to do this? Father Murr, are you aware that your own church promotes this? What are you, what are you trying to tell us, that, you're, that your church is against this? It's not. Father Murr, you belong in jail for a hate crime. <laughs> this, is, this is obvious. This is what's going to happen. It's going to happen. So you say, where, what are the people in the pews thinking? There are fewer and fewer every day. What are the priests thinking? Their morale is lower and lower every day. A lot of things have to change. There's a real need for a synod. You want a synod? I'll give you some topics to talk about in a synod. I could do that easily. Give me a list that really need to be, they should have been examined for the last 50 years and something done. We're way overboard on that. Anyway, enough said. That's that's my piece. I was really uh, moved kind of by the letter from Cardinal Zen and some of the things that he said, that to change all this denies 2,000 years. I think we at LifeSite brought that up a few weeks ago of, you know, liturgy and the expressed truth and I also am struck by the idea of how does this affect the guy in the pew? Because that's me. And I was brought to uh, faith over decades of searching. And what I was looking for and what drew me to the Catholic faith was the certainty of it, right? The kind of declarative truths that could give you guardrails, right? And to see all of that just thrown to the wayside is sort of terrifying. And I agree with you on the Marxist aspect of it. Those who don't toe the line will be marked. They, they won't get good parishes. They'll be sent out to, you know, Nowheresville, uh, if they're even allowed to stay on board. But remember, this is a church who is in an alliance with the Communist Party of China. They are allowing the bishops of China to be chosen by the Communist Party. And the faithful have no transparency on that. Uh, we've had no transparency on the sexual abuse allegations of many decades. I mean, one of the problems, Father, that you expressed that the old time parish priest who knew everyone's name, or if he didn't know you, tried to get to know you at the door, uh, even if you were there just one day, right? Part of the problem is they were moving these guys around so much that a lot of these long-term parish relationships were never able to even be developed over time. And I think all of this stems from Vatican II. I mean, I think it's the hubris of the modern priesthood that is uh, talking to an audience rather than uh, before a cross. You know, what was once sacred and mysterious it was done by the priest hunched over before the cross is now done with flair. And who, who holds the napkin more properly? And, and it, it just seems like we're, we're moving towards entertainment or, you know, a desire to fit in rather than the acknowledgement that our faith is part of not fitting in. We are on a narrow path, right? We're trying to guide people through the narrow gate and and to all of a sudden find out, hey, the walls have come down. You know, there's no gate at all. It, it, it's it's discouraging, to say the least. I don't think there's any coincidence that it was a Latin American uh, bishop who has introduced all of this Marxist theology into the package. And I also think that one has to question some of these German bishops. And, you know, what, what exactly is their background? Let's be real. The Catholic Church has been used as a tool by both sides in the Cold War. And the cost that we're paying now for priests that were ordained 40, 50 years ago uh, 
is very high. And and KGB and Russian intelligence was very involved in sort of poisoning the minds of not only the faithful, particularly in Latin America, but also the priesthood. And you know, we're now we're now seeing some of these uh, chickens come home to roost. But I still think there's a chance. I think everybody should share Cardinal Zen's letter all over the planet Earth. You know, print it out and send it to your local bishop, you know, with a kind of I agree written on the top. Those priests who refuse in China to join the patriotic church that Francis told them was okay to join, and they refuse because they know it is a tool in creation of the Communist Party, those priests get canceled, jailed, detained kidnapped. So to both of your points, you know, his ambiguity or playing with the new world order or the Marxists or the modernists or the communists has grave consequences, not only for the faith, but also for the priests who are on the front line. Um, We see it playing out every day in China. Of all his terrible mistakes, the China agreement, the secret China agreement, the untransparent China agreement is the one that is the far worse of all of them. Um, so, uh, you know, it was Tobin, Cardinal Tobin from the United States, who said just today, I think, at the Synod um, meeting after the Synod um, at the press conference, he said that the Synod has going to have significant developments about the welcoming of LGBT people. So to answer your question, John Henry, um, that's what I think uh, we have to uh, protect against, and that's what will be coming. The LMNOPs have never been not accepted in our church. I don't know one priest who has not accepted homosexuals, homosexual men or women in in his parish. I I don't know of anyone. I don't know anyone who has gone out of his way to be rude or crude or or anything else to these uh, to these people. We understand them very well. We try to accommodate them as well as we can. We are working within the framework of the church, and if they want to join us, they are more than welcome. But the rules are this way, and this is how we try to live. We try to pre- we look for perfection. We're all trying to to be perfect as our heavenly Father is perfect. Now, we've got another thing. Lex, Lex orandi, Lex credenti. This is what's going on right now, too. This came up. We have a new right, a Mayan right of mass. Now, let me let me just explain something. I was 14 years in Mexico. I would say the missions. If you would tell the Mexicans, it would be upset because they're not a missionary country, a mission country, but, but it was missions, believe me. One of the things that... I tried to do, and the clergy tried to do. God bless you, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Beautiful, beautiful, absolutely, viva. I tried to do, and 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 much of the, a lot of the clergy tried to do. We tried to rid people of superstition. This was a big problem, especially in southern Mexico and along the coasts, the tropical coasts of Mexico. There is a lot of santeria. There's this, that, and the other thing. When the missionaries came. Just like St. Paul, when St. Paul went to Greece, what did he do? He accepted the Greeks where they were. And he walked around and he he said, you know what? I found an altar when I was walking around today. It's an altar you've got here to the unknown God. Well, he took that. That's what was given to him. And he used that. He said, I've got news for you. I know that God's name. Right? Boom. There we go. You take something that's there. You build on it. And then you you raise a level. We tried to get rid of superstition. When the Spaniards came to all of Latin America, they had to deal with deep-rooted superstition. They introduced Catholicism. Many of the Protestant uh, complaints against Catholicism is that we're superstitious. We believe in this. Uh, people are killing roosters and chickens and this, that, and the other. Well, that's all Santeria. That is what we have been trying, working very hard since the conversion of South Latin America, especially, to get rid of. Now we have a new rite of mass celebrating it, built upon superstition and upon idols. 
it, excuse, there must be something wrong with me. I mean, I, this is, this is outrageous. Isn't the word I keep using that word outrageous, but I, I haven't come across a better one. We're now institutionalizing superstition and it's a, it's a, it's a, now a form of mass. It's going to be its own right. But don't you say the Tridentine Mass. Don't you dare say the Tridentine Latin Mass. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. And, and this is what also gives me hope. I know this sounds ironic, but it gives me great hope because they are scared to death of the Tridentine Latin Mass. They're scared to death of it. They are doing anything they can to stop it to squelch it, to, to, to ridicule it. There's got to be something wonderful about it, if that's how much they hate it. I mean, if that's how afraid they are of it, what power that mass must have. What power it must have. And it does. So I'm very hopeful because that's where things are going. You want, you want to know about people in the pews? I can tell you. I can tell you. The Latin mass parishes are full. Father Ilo's parish in San Francisco is full. He has Latin mass. He has a traditional, a traditional parish. He hears confessions hours a day. He's got confessionals. People are there for adoration. He built an adoration chapel. His parish, I, 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 I read his letter too, that it's difficult for him. And yes, it's difficult. I understand that. But he made a he he took a parish that was really asleep and made it alive made it alive. And he did this by giving people a devout Catholic mass. Now, that's the future. How God is going to bring this all about is beyond me. But I want to I want to be around just a few more years to be able to see what he's doing, because it's going to be sensational. And I'm just telling you, if you know a man by his friends, you can judge a man by his friends. You can also judge a man by his enemies. And if these people are afraid of the Latin Mass, it's got to be for a very, very good reason. And it's got to be wonderful. We can't end off without addressing this one more thing. Uh, Liz, what the heck was this doll that Cindy McCain gave to Pope Francis? Cindy McCain um, had a visit with Pope Francis. She is presently, you know, she's the widow of Senator John McCain, who ran in 2000 for the presidency. Um, and she is now the executive director of the UN World Food Program. She gave him this figure. And there was much discussion about who is, who, what is this figure that Cindy McCain gave the Pope? And Michael Hitchborn of the Lepanto Institute, our great researcher, Catholic researcher, um, dug and found out that um, this doll is, in fact, the ogre Soyoka Mana. And it's a woman who carries a knife and a crook to catch children, children whom she eats. The basket of food on her back, you can see the the basket on her back is what she is the food she collects from children hoping not to be captured and eaten by her by her. So, you know, I don't know what Cindy McCain was thinking. Either she didn't do her homework about this ancient um gruesome doll or she's sending some kind of subliminal message. Whatever the case, it is inappropriate mind-boggling, totally crass. And, you know, the Vatican should, if they haven't learned their lesson now, I mean, every time there's a, a visitor, they should pre-screen what is the gift that is being given to the Holy Father. Um, we saw this in Bolivia when Francis received that crucifix with the hammer and sickle. Cindy McCain, who has her own foundation, um, an anti-human trafficking organization, nonprofit. And Cindy McCain was interviewed on C-SPAN and said, well, everybody knew about Jeffrey Epstein. There was just nothing we could do about him. It hides in plain sight. Epstein was hiding in plain sight. We all knew about him. We all knew what he was doing. But we had no one that was, no um, uh, legal aspect that would go after him. They were afraid of him. For whatever reason, they were afraid of him. 
Cindy, your husband was the ranking member of the Homeland Security Committee in the Senate. He was a senator for, what, 30 some years? He ran for president. What do you mean? He could have picked up the phone of the head of Homeland Security, the FBI, and said, uh, we know about Jeffrey Epstein. He's trafficking young girls around the world. I think it's time that the FBI investigate this monster. And this is a woman who has a human trafficking organization. So for her to say, oh, everybody knew about Epstein, but we couldn't do anything about just defies any kind of belief. And here she is, you know, interestingly enough, Pope Francis found time for this UN official um, in the midst of the beginning of the synod to have her bring in this bizarre gift for him. Um, so I don't know what's going on. This is one of many strange um, gifts um, that are sending, you know, really odd, very troubling messages. Um, eating children, you know, you give the the pontiff um, a doll that collects children and eats them. I mean, you know, you can't even make this stuff up. Liz, I think you're missing the point. This is all part of the God of Surprises. Yeah, <laughs> my father, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. Excuse God. me. I, for, I forgot. The, the program. I, forgot. <laughs> I forgot. You know, the God who accepts everybody. Right. Even the Sokamana. Right. And this is to your point about the superstition, you know, the idols, the pagan idols. This is what the, you know, original Catholic missionaries had to deal with, how they had to, you know, pull people away from these demonic, dark procedures, dolls, you know, that they, they followed. So um, and anyway. I've, got, and I've got news for you. It cost uh, the lives of many of them. It cost them their lives. That, oh, yeah. That, that, that getting rid of superstition still today. These things keep happening um, at the Vatican and you just shake your head. Um, and, um, you know, just there's no explanation, only, you know, just very troubling signs for all of us. You know, I think that just means the Tiber River needs a few extra swim buddies, right? We'll put that statue where it belongs. Exactly. And secondly, let's be optimistic. It, this statue might eat cardinals. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Listen, I, I think that uh, I don't think that we should give up on this. I think that we want clarity. And realistically, I, I think that they're creating a schism in the church, and I don't see the purpose of it uh, other than for that to be the result, because the Latin Mass is, the Tridentine Mass is a perfect example of what's already happening. And Father, you said, what is it that's so powerful about it? I think I know. It's a lingua franca. It is a common tongue for all Catholics around the world. And that used to be what uh, the catechism was as well. But, you know, this has always been the criticism of the Protestants, right? Those Papists passing around notes in Latin and things like that, right? So so I, I think that's one of their great fears. I My grandmother was a longtime uh, employee of U.S. intelligence and was all over the world from the early 40s all the way to early 60s. She said one of the things that kept her from going to church after Vatican II was that she knew everywhere she was on planet Earth that the same exact words were being heard in the same exact tongue by her mother up in Forest City, Pennsylvania, and everyone else that she cared about. And it meant that she was having the same experience, whether it was in Buenos Aires or uh, Washington, D.C., so I, I, I am very hopeful in that regard, Father. I think you're, you're, you're right on. May it come soon. And the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. Um, do you remember uh, LifeSite folks in your prayers as we are at Synod and right after the Synod we'll confront it with um, both the press conference and also Rome Life Forum at the end of October. God bless you all. And thank you for joining us here on Faith and Reason.
Hi, everyone. This is John Henry Weston. We hope you enjoyed this program. To see more like it, be sure to hit the subscribe button below to get all the latest content from LifeSite News. Check the links in the description to read more and connect with us on social media so that you can stay up to date with all the latest life, family, faith, and freedom news. Thanks for watching, and may God bless you.